Welcome to Okaboji Broadcast, everybody. Cool start to our week here in the Iowa Great Lakes. My guest today is Shane Walters. He's the CEO of Sioux Rivers Regional Mental Health and Disability Services. And Shane, first of all, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you, Jeff. You know, I, I heard you give a presentation, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago, to the Dickinson County Board of Supervisors, and I kind of just thought to myself, Shane, uh, that especially right now, and it's important all the time, but right now, I don't know if enough people know of the services that are offered by you, and uh, maybe you could tell, and you sent me, you've got quite a list there, but maybe we could talk about some of the services uh, that you offer and, and what counties. Sure. Well, we, uh, our responsibility as a mental health region is to uh, ascertain that there are services of a mental health nature available within all of our counties. Uh, Sioux Rivers is comprised of five counties currently, which would be Dickinson, O'Brien, Lyon, Sioux, and Plymouth. Okay. Uh, among the services that we have a responsibility to make sure are available are uh, crisis services, which take on a, a number of, uh, um, uh, well, there, there are just a number of services involved in the crisis realm. Sure. Uh, chief among them would be uh, crisis uh, assessment and stabilization. We have a a crisis center designed to meet that need in Sioux City, actually. Okay. It's called the Assessment and Stabilization Center because uh, we're not all that creative, apparently, when we name our facilities. So. <laughs> well, it, it says what it is. <laughs> individuals are allowed to go there on a voluntary basis and can be referred from a variety of sources, hospitals, law enforcement, family members, uh, mental health centers, sure, uh, and the uh, the idea being that they would go to that facility to essentially stabilize. If they're in a crisis situation, we have medical and mental health staff uh, available twenty four seven. Okay, we have two components in that program. One is twenty uh, three hour observation and stabilization, and essentially what that is is recliner therapy in that folks may go in, they may just sit in a nice comfortable recliner. Uh, there are the staff there that would interface and uh, uh, make certain that they were um, uh, able to just uh, decompress while they're there. If they right. need further attention, then of course there would be referrals made from there to a hospital or a subacute setting or, or some other setting that okay. uh, of a higher need nature. Um, and they're allowed to to do that for you know 23 hours essentially. If it goes beyond that, then they would be. Uh, transferred to our residential unit in that same setting uh, and they can be in that setting for a number of days or weeks or even months if necessary okay now are these services are they primarily for adults then Shane this would be strictly for adults okay at this point yes okay well now how is your funding acquired uh, well, that uh, is, uh, we get that money from you, essentially, Jeff. Okay. As a taxpayer, uh, we take some of your property tax dollars and we uh, assign it to mental health. We have a levy uh, that we have to live within. That's $30.49 or somewhere in that ballpark anyway. Right. Uh, and that fluctuates from year to year because of valuations on property, but... Uh, way back in 1996, the legislature passed a bill called Senate File 69, which capped property taxes at a dollar amount. Um, and I'll just give you an example. In Sioux County, that was $1,027,000. Okay. We weren't allowed to raise one more penny than that. We're still not allowed to raise one more penny than that, and that's what, been 24 years right. ago. Um, Senate File 69 was supposed to be essentially a marriage between the counties and the state 
in that the counties would provide a, a piece of the funding and then the state would uh, would uh, fill in the, the gaps. Right. And they would handle all growth in the system and make certain that we had adequate dollars to meet the need. Well, the state, I'll tell you, has never lived up to that promise. And as of today, there virtually are zero dollars coming from the state to mental health. Uh, all of the dollars that are available to us are raised solely by that property uh, tax levy, which is again capped at the same dollar amount it was 24 years ago. Well, and there was a that was the reason I asked you that question, Shane. Uh, when we chatted on the phone the other day, you know, I I told you about how I remember going and uh, covering legislative forums, and this would be back in the the 90s, around that 24 year range, and where mental health and substance abuse workers were pleading with state legislators at that point saying you're you're cutting our funding you're you're limiting our abilities to to help people and yeah. and so you've just given credence to uh that very fact yeah we we've been making that same argument quite honestly jeff every year with the legislature that we have a, a job to do and, uh, you know, I would argue that in 24 years, uh, the, the cost of mental health uh, care has, you know, that's grown exponentially. Absolutely. So to be able to do that within that same dollar cap doesn't make any sense. Well, and, you know, and part of my issue with all that, Shane, is the fact that in those 24 years, people are falling through the floorboards and instead of getting the help that they can use, that they can use that they need they're falling through those floorboards and often end up in the legal system uh, spending time in county jails when they may need other help and, and our county jails are not equipped to handle those situations yeah that's a that's a very uh, valid point and uh, we actually have designed a program uh, called jail diversion which is you know, hopefully we're, we're able to divert people from jail settings because, you know, w with the mental health uh, issue, they, they just don't, they shouldn't be in the jail. They need to be in a mental health setting, right. whatever that might be. And so we're working towards that goal, but of course that uh, costs money to get them into another facility unless they're eligible for uh, Medicaid, uh or have private insurance, right. uh, you know, the region has to, to come up with the funding to, to make that happen. So, and many you know, people the, don't have that. Right. Most people don't. A lot of those folks that we're dealing with in that kind of a um, crisis mode don't have those things in place. Um, and when they do, you know, we're, we're, we fight a constant battle with the MCOs, which is your managed care organization. That, right. Uh, the state went to, you know, to what, three years ago, four years ago, uh, because they're, you know, they felt like a, a private uh, uh, entity would uh, do a better job of dealing with our taxpayer dollars, I guess. Right. And, you know, my, my argument there has been that each of those uh, organizations is a for-profit company. So what's their bottom line? you know, is to make some money, right? Right. <laughs> and they have a responsibility to their investors to see that profit. And so they're not always, in my mind anyway, they're not always looking out for the folks that they're charged with, uh, you know, providing funding for. And, well, and uh, so it, we fight that battle every day. Yeah, and it's a catch-22 for those who... Uh, perhaps, you know, don't have uh, the money, don't have Medicaid, don't have private insurance, and feel trapped. Where can I go? Or their family members look at them and go, we can't afford it, what do we do? And it becomes a catch-22 and a snowball that gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, that is the, that's the truth. And, and that's where, you know, the regional funding comes into play. Right. And, well, it's on us to acquire, you know, make certain they have the service, but also to fund that service. Right. Now, have we seen surges in mental health needs uh, with the pandemic? Uh, people have been out of work, uh, more pressure on them. Have we seen any uptick? 
you, you know, we have. It, it's a real dichotomy in that, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the folks that are having mental health crisis, uh, anxiety and, and, you know, things like that, right. that that's risen exponentially. I mean, we're looking at about a thousand percent increase wow. there. But, you know, to flip that, they're not seeking the help that they need because they're so anxiety ridden about doing that. Right. That we have a real, uh, you, you know, you said, you used the term catch-22 a couple minutes ago. Well, yeah. that's exactly what we're seeing here. Yeah. They need they need that attention, but they're they're afraid to seek it out. Right. So we we know that they need it, but we're having an issue trying to get them into uh, whatever setting that that they might need. So you know we're we're seeing a big need. Just a lot of folks are, are not getting out there to, to seek that assistance. So. Yeah, and and it comes back to my very first when we opened up here of uh, you know we need to let people know services are are available and of course and for substance abuse too and I can only assume that maybe uh, there's been an uptick in uh, substance abuse uh, during this time. Yeah, a big big increase there. That, that's been one of the areas where we've seen uh, quite a, a rise in, in folks seeking assistance and uh, our job is not to directly fund substance abuse services but each of the counties has a responsibility to make certain that their residents are able to uh, access those services and, and you know, inpatient, uh, you know, the, the, in the, the beds are just not readily available for substance abuse services, but there's uh, outpatient counseling that is available and we're working at trying to get those people connected. And, and that's an everyday uh, affair because that seems to have grown even beyond the mental health uh, uh, problems that we're seeing, I think. And of course, uh, I know that, you know, anonym, anonymity is always observed and, you know, people sometimes have that stigma of, I don't want anybody to know uh, I'm having issues and, and whether it's pride or just embarrassment or whatever it is, people need to let themselves go and, and realize that until I ask for help, I'm not going to get any better and there's nothing wrong with that. That's absolutely the truth, and we encourage everyone uh, to seek that help because we do uh, uh, guard their uh, identity, uh, and you know their anonymity is guaranteed. Right. Uh, HIPAA uh, controls that uh, to, to a large degree, and there are state uh, uh, codes in place that would protect their confidential information. Uh, and we're bound by that, and uh, we take that very seriously. Right. Now, I, and I saw that uh, in the near future, like uh, the start of the next fiscal year um, for the state, children's services gonna, are being looked at to be uh, offered? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's another, uh, we refer to that as an unfunded mandate. There, we have a lot of uh, unfunded mandates <laughs> these days. <laughs> yeah. the last Two years, the legislature has uh, uh, mandated essentially new services that were previously unavailable and have mandated those services to be delivered uh, or at least developed by the regions. And uh, two years ago, they determined uh, things like uh, Mobile Crisis Act, which is assertive community treatment. Um, an access center, which is a, essentially a one-stop shop for folks that have mental health and substance abuse issues. It's a no uh, reject, no eject facility and that anybody can present voluntarily or under commitment to that facility and receive services, uh, you know, in the mental health area, substance abuse, uh, subacute. Um, so we're in the process of developing that services and others, including mobile crisis, um, and uh, at this point, we're you know we're hoping to, to receive some additional funding from the state, but that's not forthcoming at this point. Yeah. Now, last year, they mandated uh, the uh, children's behavioral health services uh, to be developed by the regions, 
and then implemented by July 1st of uh, 2021. So we're right in the middle of that. We've appointed a children's behavioral health coordinator. Uh, and that would be uh, Sharon Neiman from Plymouth County. Okay. He's actively working uh, towards um, implementing or, or developing those services. And we're trying to partner with a number of uh, agencies out there. One uh, of note would be Forest Ridge in uh, up near Esterville. Right. Uh, we met with them on a couple of occasions. Uh, we're wanting to partner with them and, and you know be a bit proactive in that regard. So we're working together to try to figure out what the needs are and how best to meet those needs. We're also looking at other agencies like uh, uh, Jackson uh, in uh, uh, Sioux City. Right. They provide crisis services to children there, so we'll partner with them as well. Right. But I'm really excited about the prospects of working with Forest Ridge because they're a proven entity. They've done a wonderful job for many, many years, yes. and, and that's kind of exciting to me to be able to, to work with them. Yeah, good absolutely. People. And and uh, anybody watching us, it might be a good time to uh, email your uh, your legislator uh, and talk about the the needs for uh, at the state level for mental health and and uh, substance abuse as well. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. We we need that help because. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the development process. We're putting these services together. We're doing what we're charged with. But we have to have sustainable funding because it's we can't ask providers to step up to the plate, work with us to develop services because that costs money and time and effort, right. and then not have sustainable funding there to make certain that that can, can continue. Indeed. And I don't blame them at all for not wanting to work with us right. in that regard. Uh, and I know you have uh, people in place, county to county. If people have, if they've seen this, if they uh, go to your website and, and uh, look for help, what's the yep. best way to contact your services there at Sioux Rivers and, and uh, find out how they can get help, Shane? Well, the best way to, to do that would be to just uh, give us a call. We've got an office in every county right. and uh, a service coordinator in each county that is there strictly to meet the need of individuals in that particular location. Uh, they can access our website, which is uh, www.sucounty.com, and uh, there should be uh, contact information within the website, phone numbers, email addresses, addresses, uh, uh, physical addresses, so they, they ought to be able to get all the information they need. Uh, from the website. There right. are also the mental health centers would be noted there uh, that you know they can call directly to the mental health center if they're having a mental health uh, crisis and we would encourage that of course. Very good. Well Shane I, I thank you for sharing this information and, uh, and uh, how people can get help, how Sioux Rivers um, mental health and uh, can be helped as well with more funding and uh, appreciate all you do for the, the people of our region, Shane, and I, I thank you for taking time with me. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to get the word out because uh, we need to make certain that everybody's aware of the fact that we're here and that we're here to help. So we Very would, good. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking time with me and our, uh, our guest today has been Shane Walters. He is the CEO of Sioux Rivers Regional Mental Health and Disability Services. We thank Shane for taking time with us today and we thank you for watching us right here on Okaboji Broadcast. Okaboji Broadcast with Jeff Thee is brought to you in part by Pure Fishing in Spirit Lake. Last Touch Painting and Cleaning, providing interior, exterior, and house painting and professional cleaning services in Spirit Lake. Okaboji Mattress Company, one mile west of the junction of Highway 9 and 71 in Spirit Lake. Bank Midwest, dream big, plan wisely, live well. And Duckies Marine and Motorsports Repair in Spirit Lake.
Lakes Regional Healthcare and Avera Partner, Brands Law Office in Spirit Lake, Ruth Van Locker, where carnivores are welcome on Hill Avenue in Spirit Lake, Back Engineering in Spirit Lake, B Radiant Laser Skin Studio, newly located in the Okaboji Plaza in Okaboji, and by Quest Wealth Management, a financial advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial Services, advisors Jan Spielman, AJ Spielman, and Erica Wachholz.